Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Steve Jobs. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of PodNuts Pro. I am your host, Marvin B., coming at you live from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We are recording this on the evening of August 4th, 2021. And folks, I am not lying when I tell you we have a show that is, as my good friend Mike Smith says, jam-packed. So we are going to try to get to it as much as possible. Sitting in the green room, a gentleman in our industry who really does not need an introduction, but I will try to tell you that I think of him as the MSP godfather, someone that has guided us over 20 plus years on how to run our businesses. So Carl Palachuk is in the green room. He will be joining us shortly. I want to make sure that I get some of the announcements out of the the way quickly. The first of which, TechCon Unplugged 2021, the event that will be happening in near O'Hare Airport. I don't know why I was thinking that. Uh, Basically, Chicago, the event put on by Jeff Halish, Paco LeBron, and our new Florida man, John Dubinsky. It is September 17th through the 19th. Folks, hurry up get your tickets, and I will give you one bit of advice. If you fly Spirit, you better double check because they have been canceling flights like crazy. That is where I'm flying because I was able to get a nonstop flight, but obviously I'll be checking and checking to make sure that I can get there and get back. If you go to TechCon Unplugged, you will see a lot of sponsors there. You will see the sessions are being filled up. Uh, Jason Miller and I will be doing a session or two on Sunday that will be all about networking. Datto, one of the main sponsors, is also doing a networking session on Sunday. And for those of you that get in early on Friday, if you haven't purchased your ticket, you may want to bump it up. There is a special M365 boot camp that they are doing Friday afternoon. So it is going to be a very educational and fun time as we spend nights at the tavern there across the street and hanging out in the city of Chicago. So once again, TechCon Unplugged, head over there, get your ticket, and uh, get your room reservation for the Aloft Hotel. Uh, The rooms, I believe, were getting pretty full, so get over there and get it. And if you're watching live, thank you for watching, first of all, but you'll see the TechCon Unplugged Uh, website in the screen there. If you're listening to the audio, I will have the link in the show notes so you will not be able to miss it. And speaking of show notes, those are going to be over at podnutspro.com. That is the website for anything podcast related here. You can find the back catalog of shows. You can find a place to donate. And I do have to say thank you. We got a couple of more donations this past week. I am so happy for that. Kyle and Marius gave us some donations and i should probably mention a couple of big big donations that we're going to get so the summer tech series is coming to a close we are transitioning into this back to basic series and as part of the closeout of the summer tech series we do have at least one maybe two more sessions of those we are going to be doing a summer tech series giveaway And if you head over to podnutspro.com, there is going to be a link at the top that is simply labeled STS. And it will lead you to this page that will be the Podnuts Pro Summer Tech Series Giveaway, 
we have already at least five donations that are going to be provided as giveaways. Most of it is just a simple thank you for listening to the show, participating, and making this show be worthy of me doing for the last five years. I really want to say thank you for all of that. So there are going to be some giveaways, uh, a couple of Amazon gift cards, and not cheapies either. Some very nice Amazon giveaways. Uh, Alan Weinberger is going to be giving away a couple of his books, The Doctor is In, and my good friends over at Net Ally are going to be donating a link sprinter. So again, not nothing to sneeze at, folks. So head over to podnutspro.com slash STS. That will take you over to the page. And just to tell you about the contest, it's not really that big of a contest. All you've got to do is put in your name and email address. There are some other questions there that I would like to get some answers to, but you don't have to do it. So if you just want to be a free grubbing person and try to get some prizes, go right ahead. If you'd like to contribute to the future success of the show, go ahead and answer some questions there. There may be a couple more questions on there as we go along. And I will put obviously our uh, prize information on there as well. But that is starting right now. The page is live. The contest will go through the end of August. So basically 1159 p.m. on August 31st, it will end. And I will be announcing the winners on the very first show, September 1st, live at 8 p.m. So you don't have to be present to win, but it would be nice. So that is that. So again, podnutspro.com slash STS. I also have a couple of emails that I want to read real quick here. I got an email from John who, when I talked about the fact that I was going to be using Synology boxes, he sent me an email and said, hey, Marvin, you mentioned you were going to use a Synology box. Just want to warn you to not do as I had done. I had been running Synology for seven years, had all my tools and backups on it, and I would sign in as I needed something. Two nights ago, I signed in and was not aware that I had been hit with ransomware. I know a lot of my files were encrypted, blah, 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 and I won't read the rest of his email, but uh, we did have an email exchange back and forth. And yes, there are some extra things that you have to put in place that will protect your backups. You can encrypt the shared drive. You can hide the shared drive. You, of course, can run backups directly from the Synology box. So all those types of things that uh, a lot of us text, what do we do? You know, what do they say? The cobbler's children have no shoes. We take care of our clients, but we don't take care of ourselves. So John basically said he's going to start doing that from now on. And I got another email from a Suzanne that simply said, well, there were some other things said, but I highlighted this part. I love that you have humor in your podcast. I enjoy laughter. I like the Florida man stories. My sister and I laugh when we hear weird Florida stuff. There was a disc jockey in California that had a segment on his radio show that was called Weird Stuff That Happens in Florida. So, Suzanne, thank you very much for sending that email and uh, hope to keep you laughing throughout the show. So, let's see. Do I have anything else here? I think that's all the big announcements. So, let us get on to our guest as I mentioned, Carl Palachak, let me grab him out of the green room here. Carl has been an industry icon for, well, so I've been in the business. This is going on year 24. And as long as I can remember, Carl, I've seen your <laughs> books everywhere. So, Carl, welcome to the show. Thank you. It hasn't, it hasn't actually been 24 years, although, you know, I'm old, but I'm not that old. So, <laughs> all right. Well, that just goes to show that it took me a few years to get around to uh, seeking out tools and literature to help me in the business. Well, it's interesting when I started. So I started in 1995. I left a, a real paying job to do this. And um, there was no standardization. There were no tools. The, the term managed services did not exist. You know, <laughs> it was right. a very, very different world. So. Uh, I'm happy to have been part of the evolution of this industry. 
All right. Well, Carl, first thing I got to say is normally we talk about the weather when we get started. And here in Florida, we are in the midst of hurricane season, which means it pretty much rains every day at some point and had a big, huge storm this afternoon. The sun did come out, but your background looks like it should be here and not there. Well, I love being on the beach anytime I can. I don't know if you could read these surfboards, but they say relax, focus, succeed. So when I moved into this office, I had a friend who does murals and she had donated a mural to charity. <laughs> so I bought it and made her uh, draw this on the wall. So there's palm trees uh, up there. And I don't know if you can tell, but I have a grass mat as the carpet. And so I can sit in that chair on the beach anytime I want to. Okay. So the chair is real. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, is that a penguin on the pillow? Uh, it's that? a toucan, but oh, there's toucan. a little table okay. back there. So I have a cal candle on it. And uh, All you right. know, so I can just hang out. Nice. Very nice. And uh, your brother lives here in Florida. Yeah, he's in uh, uh, Clearwater. He's on the other coast. Yeah. So when I hop over there and see some friends over there, I got to see Ryan and Steve Cherubino, Mike Smith, a few other people. We'll have to do a little meetup over there. Yeah. Uh, he lived in Fort Lauderdale for about eight years, I think, and then decided he'd go where the weather is nicer. He wanted the nicer beach. That's what it was. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I've been... Uh, with friends scuba diving off of Fort Lauderdale. I didn't scuba dive, they did, but uh, I went snorkeling and it was like, the, the water was like a ocean lake. It was so calm, I couldn't believe it. That, that coast is, I mean, it is the Gulf side. The water is usually like a glass and the waves, they're like mini waves. They're not even, they're ripples, uh, but the wife loves it. We go over there a lot of times to do shell hunting because you can walk out, I mean, you can walk out 100 yards sometimes and uh, get some nice shelves over there. So she loves it. And of course, the beaches, white sands, all of that stuff. And our good friend John had to put his little comment in there, the best coast. <laughs> so thank you, John. Always reminded me of that. So, Well, I've been to a lot of beaches in a lot of countries. And I have to say Fort Lauderdale is one of my favorite, like that, that whole area is just delightful. So, well, it's gotten a lot better since the days of spring break, you know, <laughs> they, they kicked those people out, beautified the walkways and everything. And got a lot of nice hotels along the beach. And I've nice never place. been there when there was some big festivity or spring break going on, but, uh, and in, in the normal times of the year, uh, I find it delightful. So, it's a nice place. I love it. I'm not moving. I told the wife when, when she got down here, you're stuck. <laughs> you're, you're a Florida man forever. That's what yes, you're saying. I am. <laughs> I am. All right. Speaking of that, let's go ahead and get to our new segment here, because I think you guys are going to love the Florida man story that I have today. So ladies and gentlemen, let's get right to it. In the news. So in our first story, Google thinks humans are too ignorant to know what they're really doing. So they have unveiled Google Identity Services, a set of standard interfaces that lets developers integrate Google's OneTap for faster user signups and simpler sign in. Google Identity Services aims to make it easier for businesses to gain new users and make life easier for users to sign in. It's available as a software development kit containing its identity APIs, including the Sign with Google button, as well as the new OneTap prompt. It uses security tokens rather than passwords to sign users into partner websites and apps. So that will be a very interesting situation. And I'm sure it's going to be great for IT administrators to lock that kind of stuff down because we have so much fun now with users saving all their passwords in their browsers exactly. and syncing them back home to their houses. <laughs> it's funny. So I have, I just got a new phone. Uh -huh. It's got the finger touch, you know, for, for passwords. And as soon as you finish setting it up, it says, just so you know, your fingerprint may be less secure than a good pin. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> So yes. why are we doing it? 
Yeah, fingerprints that are supposed to be like the one identifiable thing unique to each person. Interesting. All right. So let's get to this story. And I have to actually get this set up with a video. So let me get over to that. So if you are listening to the audio portion, you're going to want to at least head over to the show notes and check out this link. So new at six, a CBS four news. Ex- I'm going to turn off the audio there, but you can see it. Holy iguana. A trip to the bathroom took a terrifying turn for one Florida man after he found a spiny tailed iguana in his toilet. Kurt Hilbreth told CBS affiliate WFOR that he went to the bathroom to brush his teeth on July 24th when he spotted the disturbing sight out of the corner of his eye. It was so big that it was not submerged completely in the toilet. The Hollywood resident, and Hollywood is right down the street from me, folks, said he initially decided to take matters into his own hands by dressing in protective gear and attempting to pull the iguana from the toilet bowl by himself. However, every time he went to do so, the reptile kept swimming back down into the toilet, evading capture. It wasn't until three days later that he realized he would need to call in experts after coming extremely close to capturing it. And all I got to say is, there is no way in hell that I am waiting three days. So the interesting thing about iguanas is because they're such an invasive species right now, it is actually legal to kill iguanas, but you have to do it humanely. Not only are they invasive, they carry a lot of uh, different types of bacteria. The things that they are most famous for are salmonella and botulism, but there are so many other things that you could get. So... That is it, folks. That is your Florida man story (laughs) for the day. I think it would take me three minutes to realize that I need to call somebody to take care of that. (laughs) I don't don't even think it would have taken that long. I probably wouldn't have tried. I guess depending on how big it is. I don't have any kind of a grabbing device for, you know, they, they have these things like for picking up snakes and, you know, whatever. I don't, you know, I don't have one of those sitting around my house. I don't either. So just another Tuesday in Florida. (laughs) Gators and iguanas. All right. So, Carl, let's uh, go ahead and roll into our topic here. So back to basics. And this is going to be a little different based on the guests that we have. But you are the first guest. I want to thank you first for agreeing to do this. And it seemed appropriate that as we talk about people either starting an MSP business or pivoting because there's a lot of people that got displaced from their corporate jobs and are looking to start businesses. I've had a couple of conversations you probably have as well. So as people pivot into making this a new business venture or current IT providers that were previously break fix and are now looking to transition into MSP, a lot of things to consider. So I think you're the perfect person for that. Oh, thank you. Happy to be here. All right. So I guess we should probably start with a discussion that I know a lot of us have had. But let's start. What is really an MSP? Because the the IT industry seems to be, I don't want to say at odds, but the definition has varied greatly as to who is and is not an MSP. I myself don't necessarily consider myself a full MSP, but I do provide some managed services. I call myself a hybrid. So some people slap me on the hand for that. Others are like, no, you're an MSP, do it. So what do you guys, uh, what do you think about that? You know, it's funny. When we first started talking about this way back, like literally 2004, 2005, I remember traveling around and I would find myself on the stage with Amy Luby and Eric Simpson. And we would each start with what we thought we were talking about. Like, (laughs) what is this? So it's very interesting to see, you know, more than 15 years later, that's still part of the discussion. Um, In general, we knew that we were on to something even before the name managed services was out. But basically the elements are that what you're looking for is 
something, in my opinion, that is maintenance focused, maintenance based. And that's the key to success. Um, and then, of course, the elements that make get everybody's attention are flat fee, which does not mean all you can eat. There's no such thing as all you can eat. That simply doesn't exist. Uh, and regular billing. And to me, there has to be a signed contract and you have to get paid in advance. So one of my great rules is that I get paid in advance for everything. So if you put those together, um, part of what you find is there's a distinction between managed services where you basically try to get your arms around all of the client's technology and, and manage it as if you were an in-house IT person, except you just happen to be outsourced because it's too expensive to, especially for a small business, to have competent full-time in-house IT. It doesn't make sense for, you know, 10 users, five users. Um, but, you know, there's kind of distinction between that and, you know, some people call it break fix or on demand. But basically, there are people who legitimately provide tech support, but they they don't take responsibility for the whole network. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a legitimate business model, but just it's not managed services. And unfortunately, what's happened in the last, I don't know, eight years or so, everybody has called themselves a managed service provider, even if they don't provide managed services. Okay. Now, I don't want to get too far into a lot of your stuff that you've done. You've, you've you know, authored over 20 books. Uh, you're probably most famous for managed services in 30 days. So I can direct people to that book. What are some things that if you were to look back and say, have the wisdom that you have now, what might be some things that you would do differently in terms of starting an MSP or starting an IT business? Well, I'd say probably the biggest one that I, I spun my wheels on, on and off and wasted so much of my life <laughs> was trying to hire a salesperson before I was ready. And I would say right now today to anybody who's doing managed services or break fix or anything, just getting started, or even if you've been trying this for five years, if you don't have a million dollars in revenue and you can't handle another million dollars in revenue in the next year, do not give any uh, attention whatsoever to hiring a salesperson. You know, it's just, it's, it's too difficult and too many people go down the road like I did spinning their wheels, trying to figure out how to make that work mathematically and so forth. And at the end of the day, it doesn't make sense unless you become a 100% sales focused organization, which means you care more about new sales than you do about service. And if that's the case, that's cool. Um, I don't think 99% of your listeners want to be in that boat. All right. So your business, how long did you have your business before you sold it? I don't remember. Uh, about 17 years. Okay. All right. And you, you said you Actually, spun your wheels. 22 years. I'm sorry. 22. With, okay. Yeah. So it was just recently that I got out of it entirely. So, all right. So you said you spun your wheels doing that first. What was it that actually got you traction to get your business going and scaling the way that well, you wanted? I, I was growing the business. It was just, I was always spending too much attention trying to figure out how to do, how to hire a salesperson. Okay. And I think ultimately the owner has to just accept the fact that you will be the salesperson uh, at, at least for if, until you reach a million dollars in revenue. Um, it just mathematically, if you think about it, a salesperson, let's say that they want to earn a hundred thousand dollars and you give them 10% of, of, uh, gross. Well, uh, that means literally they have to sell a million dollars and you have to deliver a million dollars on top of whatever else you're doing. And so it just doesn't make sense. Um, but, I spent, I, I think that where my business took off, uh, ironically enough, is when I discovered that I have uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And what happened was I became very ill in a very short period of time. And I had to learn to focus very, very clearly on exactly what needs to be done um, because I had a very shortened work week. I could not work 
the 40, 50, 60 hours a week that many people work. And so what happened was I learned to delegate. I learned to document everything. I learned to do things the right way and to not waste my own time doing stuff that didn't matter and didn't pay. Uh, and so there's a little irony that Relax, Focus, Succeed came out of me waking up one day and saying, how did I get to be so successful in my business and have work-life balance and work about 35 hours a week and, uh, you know, sleep most of the weekend? Uh, and so I would just adopt the philosophy of work-life balance much sooner. Uh, and I know a lot of people resist that because we live in an uh, environment where everybody thinks that workaholism is the only way to get ahead. And it's simply not the case. In fact, it's the opposite of true. Well, there's a lot of YouTube influencers that are just pushing that where you just, you got to grind and, you know, work your 50, 60, 70 hours now so that you don't have to later. But it turns out we find a lot of those people are still working too much and never really realize happiness. Right. Well, and part of it is, you know, I mean, the most obvious piece is that you have to recharge your batteries, right? If I gave you a choice, would you want a doctor to open you up and start doing surgery on the first hour or the 11th hour of their 12 hour shift? I'll bet (laughs) you want the doctor when they're fresh in their first hour. Because we all know that all the mistakes are made in the 10th, 11th, 12th hour that you're working. Um, And at the same time, you are not paying attention to your family and your kids and uh, you don't have a life. I've known so many people that once they get over the workaholism stage, they literally start you know, texting me every 20 minutes. What do I do now? What do I do now? And I'm like, you need to get a hobby, right? You haven't had a life. (laughs) And now you have all this time on your hands. You need to go get a life and it will help you live longer. Um, The other thing is it really does help you to be more productive at work when you take time to not work. Uh, You know, your brain relaxes and you've seen this where you solve problems in the shower It's not because you're in there with a computer. It's because you're in there without a computer, without a radio, without headphones. And an idea just pops into your head. It's because your brain is working on things without you actively having to be head down facing uh, a monitor in order to get something done. Uh, So it's also the case that I prioritize everything. And so the most important stuff always gets done. All right. So I was going to mention this later, but since you brought it up now, we'll go ahead and say that you actually titled a book, the same as your surfboards back there, (laughs) Relax, Focus, Succeed. And it talks about all of these things you just mentioned that, you know, people need to take the time to do that balance early in the process. Yeah. It's interesting because you talk about these YouTube videos, but if you read books from people who uh, are industrialists and the most successful people, 95 out of 100 of the most successful people you could name in any industry in all of history have eventually told people that they need to have work-life balance and they need to relax and have hobbies and have a life. And that includes, you know, the, the likes of Jack Welsh and, you know, people that that have been extraordinarily successful in the modern era. And they all tell you that message. So the the people who say, well, the world isn't the same as it used to be. And, you know, it's not like it used to be. Uh, Trust me, every generation thinks that it's different than the previous generation. And the the human uh, nature is you have to have balance. Otherwise, uh, it's much more likely that you will die of a heart attack then that you will become marvelously successful at age 40 and never have to work another day in your life. Mm. So as part of getting that work-life balance, so the personal side, you've got to mix in there, but let's say on the business side, I think one of the things that I have seen from, you know, from myself and from others is that we don't get balance within the business. Uh, You mentioned chasing the sales. 
uh, that becomes a passion for people that kind of interferes with other stuff. For some, it's trying to automate the business. For some, it's finding the perfect RMM. Um, so for some, it's, uh, you know, finding the right processes to, you know, have text doing everything and the owner does nothing. So there's all those different things. So when it comes to you being able to advise some people that come to you for advice, what are some, some tips and things that you tell them that they're not getting from the books because they wouldn't keep asking if they were, but what are some things that you <laughs> have been telling people that, you know, they're not getting, um, and helping them to, to get their business started off right? Well, it's interesting, you know, when you look at people who are, you know, motivators, Zig Ziglar and Brian Tracy and so forth, again, they all seem to have the same kind of messages. Um, and it only hits home for you when you've read it enough times that your brain is primed for it. And then the one time that you read that, you suddenly think, oh, this person is a genius, <laughs> even though they're telling you what all the other books have told you. Um, I would say one of the most important things anybody can do beginning, middle or end of your career, but um, it's a great habit to start early on. I encourage people to create one, three and five year plans every year and to constantly commit yourself to change. And here's the thing you won't hear, I don't think, from anybody else. Commit to the change before you know what the change is going to be. In other words, commit that you will change your business in the next year and wait to see what that change is. But when you recognize, ah, this looks like a good thing, a good direction I can go, you have already committed that you're open to that change and you're going to let it happen. Now, that's different from saying, you know, follow every dream that wanders in or every uh, lunatic who puts up a YouTube video. Um, commit to a three-year plan, commit to a five-year plan. Always be willing to change your plans. It's like, this is not a game where you like lose some points if you change your plans. Commit to the change and then find good changes that you can implement. And I know that sounds a little odd, but too many people are not successful in business because they're waiting for things to be perfect, right? And I've actually got a quote up here that opportunities are easily lost while waiting for perfect conditions. Gary yeah. Ryan Blair, right? I've got a poster right there. Okay. <laughs> because too many people, oh, I, I, I got to have the perfect RMM and the perfect PSA and I have the perfect automation and then I'll get my per first perfect client and then my first perfect employee. And, you know, seven years later, nothing's perfect and they're still waiting to launch and it's much better to launch make a bunch of mistakes break a bunch of shit and then fix it and and straighten out figure out what works for you and move in that direction so when you talk about just doing it which i've tried to advise people you know first of all just go out and get started there's this concept that everybody has to have all the pieces in place like you said have everything perfect have their rmm have their psa have their insurance have this this cyber security and there have been some people that i've spoken with where i've had to say well do you have a client yet <laughs> and are they are they going to pay for that stuff well not only that but i sure that you've talked to people that they have paid money for a PSA. They haven't just committed. They they signed a deal. They're paying money out oh, yeah. the door every month for a PSA and an RMM and all these tools, and they don't have a single client. And it's like, no, no, no. Let's literally put the cart before the horse. Let's, let's put the horse first. <laughs> let's go get a client and then figure out what you need. And a lot of these tools are awesome. Like I love RMM. You know, there's currently a debate of whether or not you even need one. Well, you do. In my opinion, you do need one. Um, but I didn't need one. I didn't get one until I had, I think, 72 machines, 72 servers under maintenance. And then I got it and I said, OK, well, now I can manage these machines and more. All right. And so I, I didn't need to automate it when I was able to manage everything myself. Um, it was when I couldn't manage it myself that I got tools to automate. Um, and that's, you know, that's a personal preference. But um, uh, uh, yeah, back to perfection. Perfection really is a stumbling block for many people. Um, the other thing is, you know, sometimes people 
think that they have to do it a certain way. So they try to go find the guru that will help them. And it's, you know, I always say the secret sauce comes in a clear jar with the label on the back that has all the ingredients. In other words, there is no secret. We all know exactly how to be successful. We just have to sit down and do it. And that's why there are shows like yours and there's coaches and, and you know, groups that you can join and, you know, peer groups and that sort of thing. Sometimes we need somebody to just give us a little push, even though we already know where we want to go. All right. Okay. So I have this question here, and it's not in the order that makes it sound <laughs> like it belongs here. But money always seems to be a sticking point where people are always trying to figure out what is the pricing model, what's the billing model, and you know, forget whether you bill up front or you bill after the fact, but trying to find that profit margin or what do I bill per endpoint or, or things like that. Why is that something that is such an enigma for us? You know, well, for- I think that there's the people, first of all, people spend too much time paying attention to their competition. I firmly and absolutely believe your competition is irrelevant and you should never pay any attention to them. Every minute spent paying attention to your competition is a minute you're not spent paying attention to your clients. Um, So there's that. But second, I think a lot of people just don't have the self-confidence to say, I'm worth $100 an hour. I'm worth $150 an hour. And that's what I'm going to get. And just do it. Um, Way back, one of the other great founders of our industry is Harry Brelsford. And in his first book on small business consulting, he said, look, it's math. What do you want to earn? Take that, divide it by 2000. That's, you know, your hourly rate, period. It's literally as simple as that. You want to earn 100,000 divided by 2000. Okay, great. There's your hourly rate. And so it, it, in ways it can be as simple as that. Um, but too many people are like, oh, my clients wouldn't pay this. My clients wouldn't pay that. And then I go on, you know, like I do a webinar and I, mention my pricing and people say, he's full of baloney. Nobody would pay that much. Nobody would do that. (laughs) There's no such thing as a $7,000 server in small business, right? There are people paying $40 an hour and there are people paying $240 an hour and there's everything in the middle. And I literally tell people, you need to go do what you want to do with your business model and then find people who want to do business your way and stop following other people and taking their advice. When I look at my books, like Managed Services in a Month, I give a very specific step-by-step guide of how to do business exactly the way I did it. And virtually no one does that. I know they all buy the book, but they buy the book, they read it, they, they integrate it with the way they want to do business, and they create something new and unique that I probably wouldn't recognize if I went into their business. <laughs> but, you know, it's just a matter of they just needed to think about things for a while and then decide how they want to do business. And, you know, even you think about your own business. There are about 7 billion people you don't do business with. So your opportunities are unlimited. And if you decided you only wanted to deal with specific people with specific technology who do a specific thing and you only wanted to work four days a week, you could absolutely build a business doing that. You just got to figure out what it looks like and then go do it. Well, and that's what I've tried to do. I, you know, I like my business model and it is, it is not the prototypical MSP model. It's not a computer repair shop, which is my background. I came out of a computer repair shop, but I have my boutique style clients that have been with me for years. And the only reason some of them aren't with me, you know, for as long as I've been around is because I either fired them or they went out of business or or something like that. Um, And in fact, I did have a client recently. So most of my contracts, I don't tell my clients Like if I go and meet a prospect, they're like, well, what do you charge? I don't know until I see what it is we need to do. I just don't do that. And I have one client that I sub for where my billing rate, 150 an hour. And the lady that is the office manager for them, 
looked at me one day and said, you need to charge a lot more. <laughs> and I said, really? And she said, yeah. And she said, the people that, you know, help us out of New York, they don't know half the stuff you do and they're charging a lot more. Well, and that's the thing, I, you know, I would say if you want to find out what people are charging, go down to Best Buy and Staples and Office Depot and find out what their underqualified technicians are charging. And, you know, they've got a system where they don't really keep track of stuff. They have no background on a client's technology. They don't track anything. They don't really take responsibility. Um, but they've got a really high hourly rate. And if you're not charging at least that much, I recommend that you do. <laughs> and they used to have it published right, you know, on the open. It used to be on a board or you go to the website. So it's it's not well, they've got fun. pamphlets, so uh, you can go to Best Buy and pick up a pamphlet and, you know, just see what they're charging. All right. So let's quickly try to bring in a component that I wanted to get to for people that are trying to transition. And we'll start first with a lot of MSPs now want to be MSSPs, where they want to make their entire focus on security. Obviously, that's a big topic. Ransomware is just about everywhere. Uh, what do you think about that transition that uh, a lot of people are doing? Well, I think if you go full on MSSP and you don't do old school, old school, now it's old school, managed services. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's so 2020. <laughs> yeah, that, that, yeah, exactly. That is so 20 minutes ago. But if you decide to get away from MSP and go into MSSP, I think you can be extraordinarily successful. I would say especially, I mean, we've all seen the news. It's really, really hard to be at the top of your game in security today. And, uh, you know, the next international incident that will take down thousands of machines could happen by the time this podcast is over or tomorrow or next week or next month, but it will happen. And uh, so that's a, that's a tough road to hoe, but you can do it if you're completely dedicated. And the danger, I think, is too many people want to have one foot in managed services because that today that pays the bills and then one foot in that other world. And I think that's really hard. It's because ultimately it's almost like, you know, gaining the mystical knowledge. Once you have the knowledge of what's out there and how big and how bad it is, you can no longer give substandard support. Um, I think that we're entering an era where managed service providers need to partner with managed security service providers in order to provide the full scope of services. You know, uh, there are just, there are levels and, and details that make it nearly impossible for most managed service providers to actually provide the highest level of support uh, that people promise when they say that they're managed security service providers. So we've been kind of being pushed in that area with a lot of the compliance. Um, HIPAA, FINRA were things right. that, you know, came into law for those uh, those areas. And, you know, if we provide support for them, we've got to abide by those. But now we've got states that are now looking into defining what an MSP is. Right. And that is going to legislate some stuff on our behalf. Well, and I don't know if you've heard of the organization Termageddon. So they provide an attempt for you to stay within all of the laws of all of the organizations that you ever deal with in all the, the states and cities and counties in the world, <laughs> right? There's privacy laws that change every single week and, you know, certainly uh, every month and sometimes every day. And it's across every state, every county has got this. And it's nearly impossible to keep up. So they're sort of what they do is they you you fill out a form and check all the boxes of, you know, who you do business with and what you do and what kind of information you handle. And they do the Zen diagram of or the Venn diagram of all of the uh, all of the laws that you're subject to. And it's nearly impossible to keep up. Um, and now we are entering an era where people will follow the state of Louisiana and states will begin to define managed services and managed security services. Um, I don't know that they'll necessarily get it right, which is why I think that we need to have a seat at the table when that's being discussed. Yeah. Should be interesting. 
And I know that it won't be something that we can cover here, but I know that you are working with putting together this National Society for IT Providers. Uh, so that should be something that if, if you're listening to this show, pay attention to that. Actually, it's National Society for IT Service Providers, right? In T in S it's ITSP dot org. Okay. So uh, we should definitely pay attention to that. And I'll grip the link for that and put that in the show notes as well. All right, Carl, I want to, let's see here. How are we on time? Let me do this. Let me, you have another book that I think is something that anybody that is providing support or wanting to be an MSP, absolutely unbreakable rules of service delivery. And that is, did I find that on? Yep, there it is on the Amazon. So we'll have that. (laughs) And it is uh, how to manage your business to maximize customer service, profit, and employee culture. So that is a book that everybody should have. And I'm sorry that I don't have it, but I will get it. But uh, you've got some, uh, some nice little set of rules in here. And uh, you had mentioned earlier that you prioritize everything. Well, that's the the number one rule of my personal life as well as my business life. Okay. Is that uh, I just, I think it's very important to have everybody working from highest to lowest priority. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's more important to manage your tickets that way uh, than to schedule them. You know, the, the, People who make PSAs, they they can just drag and drop a scheduling module into their software, so they do. And so even though it's a horrible way to manage tickets, um, they make it easy for you to fill up your uh, technician's service tickets uh, as like little domino stacked an eighth of an inch apart. Uh, but I prefer that technicians work on the most important things that need to be done and office managers and administrative assistants and salespeople. So I think everybody should work from highest to lowest priority. And that way things move really, really fast. I think, you know, people who are reluctant to try this, I think if you try it for a week, you'll be shocked at how fast things move. Um, But you have to be the one who uh, actually looks at things and determines that you can't have everything be high priority or nothing is high priority. Mm. All right, so there's five major sections, and I just want to hit one thing from each section. So that was the general rules. The All first right, I'll one, go fast. Prioritize everything. <laughs> the second one, rules for client management. The first one there, define your ideal client and go get them. Again, this goes back to, you know, create the business you want and then go find people who want to do that. Um, for me, I always was thinning out my clients as I started to grow. I would thin out clients and thin out clients. And so my ideal client went to five users and then to 10 users. And then it became only people who would sign contracts. And then it became only people who would sign uh, managed service contracts. And, you know, I kept lifting the bar higher and higher and filtering out people who were not ideal for me at that stage of my business. Um, And I think that's huge. Uh, Too many people just think they have to take everybody and they have to do everything and they won't give you the excuse, especially when you're starting out. Yes. No, when you're starting out, that's the time to develop good habits and not deal with people who won't pay their bills and people who, you know, want you to do one little thing and then say, oh, and this includes free tech support for the rest of my life. No, it does not. They become hangers on because yes. then they're like, well, you've been my you've been my IT person for so long. I can't trust anybody else. Right. <laughs> well, then you should be willing to pay for that. Yes. Uh, The next session, rules for managing employees. The first item there, hire an administrative assistant. So this is another one of my big rules. You know, if you're starting out or if you want to actually stop struggling and start improving your business, one of the best things you can ever do is hire an administrative assistant. Hire somebody 20 hours a week, um, part time, uh, you know, 15, 20 dollars an hour. And they will do an amazing amount of work for you that you don't have to do. And that frees up your time so that you can go off and either provide more tech support, right? You're paying somebody $20 an hour and you're doing work at 150. So it doesn't take very much to pay for them. Or you can spend that time making more sales. 
Um, and I would tell everybody, your first hire absolutely should not be a technician. It should be an administrative assistant. All right. Next one here, rules for billing and finance, control billing and cash flow. So uh, Rayan, I know, has either has been or will be on your show uh, for this particular series. And uh, Rayan Buccianico always says, you know, cash flow is it. Like, if you don't do that, don't do anything else. <laughs> yep. Right. Uh, you literally should know how much money you need between now and the next payroll. And then between that payroll and the next payroll after that. And that way you can actually see money flowing into and out of your company. And if you're struggling and you're not doing daily cash flow reports, you are doing yourself a disservice. If you are struggling by any definition of those, that term, you must do cash flow reports. As soon as you start putting your attention on the money that flows in and out of your business, you'll get better at managing the money that flows in and out of your business. Um, I recently changed the, the amount of cash I keep in my checking account because I always want to be able to have at least as much as there as I could expect between the best month and the worst month in terms of revenue, mm -hmm. right? And if that swing is $10,000 for you or $20,000 for you, you should have that much cash available to you so that during the swings, you are not scratching and clawing and trying to figure out what to do and making bad decisions because the money is crunching. All right. I have a similar deal where I keep enough cash to cover the next month's expenses, period. Uh, so we never try to go below, below that. And it's a little different than my personal where we have a nice, huge you know, savings account buffer. Uh, the business, I've got a business line of credit that we don't touch unless we need it. That is separate from, you know, the payments that we do for our vendors and stuff and right. any any credit that we got. So, yes, cash flow is uh, king in my yes. book. <laughs> all right. And then rules for service tickets track all time inside your business. That's something that a lot of people do not do. Actually, most people don't do this and they should. And what's odd is that when people go to manage services, they say, oh, I, I don't have to do that because I do flat fee services. But you still buy time from technicians and you sell time to clients, even if you buy it flat fee because they're on a salary and you sell it flat fee because people are on a contract. You still, ultimately, you get so, many, so much time into your business and you spend so much time in your business. And unlike almost everything else in your life, time is something you can't make more of and everybody gets the exact same amount and you have to decide how you're going to use it. And if you were, I will tell you this, if you're not tracking 40 hours of a week for every one of your employees, you cannot run a report and tell me whether a client is profitable, whether a mm -hmm. contract is profitable, whether a project is profitable, whether an employee is profitable, you can guess and you can say, well, I make money at the end of the year. Yeah, but do you make enough? And, you know, you have clients who at the end of the month end up paying you $17 an hour. And you have clients who at the end of the month pay you $1,000 an hour because they don't ask for a lot of help. Do you know absolutely and definitively which of those clients is which? My guess is you don't and you can't prove it because you don't track all the time in your business. Yep. Track everything. Cause not only do you need to know which clients are profitable, you need to know which areas of your business are profitable, right? Maybe you're spending too much time on the RMM and automation, but you're not spending enough time over here. And for people that want to grow their business to sell, how are you going to be able to put a value on your business? If you can't tell where your profitable areas are. Yeah. I would say if you, if you don't know Excel, one of the best things you can do in your business is open up Excel and start building a spreadsheet for anything that crosses your mind <laughs> yeah. only because just analyzing your numbers and digging into the money inside your business is always helpful. It's just always enlightening and you'll find stuff. You're like, I, I had no idea that this client was so profitable or that this uh, technician was so unprofitable. Uh, I yep. just assumed everything was good. Yeah. Just because you don't hear doesn't mean that, uh, all is good. Right. 
All right. Well, Carl, I know we're coming up here to the top of the hour and I know we couldn't cover everything, but I really appreciate your time with us here and uh, sharing your knowledge. And of course, folks, Carl Palachek, um, one of the icons of our industry, has authored over 20 books and probably has all of the best-selling books under the topic managed services. <laughs> so um, I will have the links to some of the books we talked about in the show notes. And we will not be doing a Florida Man Challenge. So, Carl, let me go ahead and pull up a random question here. You should tell uh, them what the random question is that you're not going to give me. Oh, <laughs> so we were pulling up a, a question just to see, and it came up. If you were to start a new business, what type of business would it be? <laughs> we couldn't do that. Pass. Um, but here is a question. Uh, what have you really wanted to do for a long time but haven't done yet? Well... Sadly, it's get on an airplane and go back to Thailand. I was in Thailand oh. last year and uh, uh, in February, actually, I got it. I went to Thailand and then I went to Cambodia and then I came home and I've been home ever since. So <laughs> mm. I want to go back to Thailand. So if if 18 months is uh, is a long time, then that would be my answer. All right. Well, I will be getting on a plane for the first time in a long time in September as I travel up to Chicago for that conference. So, yes. All righty. Well, very good. Thanks for having me. I certainly appreciate it. All right. So, folks, if you are watching us live, uh, there will be a post show. Carl will not be staying through the break, but uh, if you are willing to stay, I will stay. For those of you listening by audio, thank you for downloading, subscribing to the show. And remember, head over to podnutspro.com, check out the tab STS and sign up for the Summer Tech Series giveaway. And there's a new blog section there too. So I want you to tell me how we do on my first blog. I think it'll be a topic that you don't really expect from me. So on behalf of my good friend, Carl Palachek, thank you very much for coming on. We will be back next week with another segment of Back to Basics. That is going to do it for this episode. We'll see you next week. And until then... Holla.